Hello and welcome to Jump To It. I'm Shane Anderson and on today's show we're going to be focusing on some great racing coming up in Ireland and England this weekend. Of course we've got some feature races uh, at Newmarket including Group 1 contests for the two-year-olds as well as, as I mentioned, some really strong racing coming up at the Curra. There's been plenty of talking points, particularly around jumps racing and we're going to get right into it as Stephen Harris and Ed Quigley join me. Stephen, I'll start with you. There's a lot of discussion around. We're still right in the middle of the flat season proper as we get to the, the, you know, the big majors of the year towards the end of the flat season but everyone's talking about jumps racing in particular shishkin he just might be jumps racing's next superstar what do you think yeah well hopefully we'll be showing of course we've lost a couple this week haven't we monkfish out for the season uh, min's been retired we lost altior last week so it's a bit uh, it'd be great if shishkin can step forward i know he's always been held in fantastic regard he always comes with that slight risk factor in that he's ridden by nico de boinville who was someone we discussed most weeks on uh, jump to it last season but he's a top class horse he's going to be one of the most exciting horses for the season ahead it is a welcome you into the conversation nicky henderson is basically saying he's got all the attributes of some of the great two mile chases that he's had including altior do you think he could be that ready replacement or is this still a fair bit for him to prove he looks it, doesn't he, Shane? He looks after the potential. I mean, it's quite funny, really. I mean, nothing's really happened, um, as you say. But yet, um, like Shishkin's making the headlines after this Nicky Henderson uh, kind of bulletin because he's he's grown so much. Uh, he's, he's grown about three inches and put on masses of kilos and everything. And so, yeah, as a consequence, he's been shortened by about six bookmakers for the champion chase on, on, the, on the account of him growing over the summer, which is, is, is quite amusing, I think, to be honest with you. But look, uh, it was a little bit underwhelming at Aintree. But that was the end of, a, 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 end of the season. He's had a wind operation, I believe, which is, uh, it seems to be the magic trick for a lot of the trainers at the moment. But yeah, look, I mean, it's still early days, but uh, Shishkin does look the natural uh, to, to fill the kind of the boots of those uh, Altiors, you know, Sprinter Sapkris. Uh, seven to four for the champion chase, not for me so far in advance, but um, wouldn't it be a big shock if he, he turned up and was the horse to beat in March? Well, Stephen, as you touched on uh, just prior to bringing Ed into the conversation, we've lost Eltior, who's now officially retired. Min's now been officially retired. He was a great competitor against Eltior. Monkfish is on the sidelines with injury. OK, we're getting a lot of positive vibes, but we often get positive vibes from Nicky Henderson about his horses with, say, uh, Shishkin. Do you think this season could actually see a complete rearranging of the, uh, the ranks in a lot of the divisions in national hunt racing? Could we see you know, a new star, whether it be Shishkin at the two mile level or in particular, some of the longer divisions. How do you assess what this season will present, even though we're still a few weeks away from it starting in proper? Well, well there's bound to be loads of um, new imports coming over. Willie Mullins, Gordon Elliott's going to be chomping at the bit to make an immediate impact. He's got some fantastic young horses. Um, it, it does feel a bit like um, there's going to be a bit of a changing of the guard in some of these top races. Uh, certainly, Plenty of them away from these superstars and much of a muchness have been beating each other. There's no massive standout contenders apart from Shiskin. I know that a horse we're going to talk about, I'm sure, in the next few weeks is, is I Am Maximus um, of Nicky Henderson's, who is apparently, I'm reliably informed, Nicky Henderson's super novice hurdle uh, uh, intended runner and main hope for that race. Now, he, he's only run once. He beat a horse called My Drogo in a bumper at Cheltenham. Uh, and the My Drogo is another massive horse to follow of Dan Skelton. So they're two names that, that could really break into grade one company uh, through, over the winter months. But it's quite an exciting time, Shane. We're always going to lose a few horses. That's the nature of jump racing. But where it's, in my opinion, slightly better for punters rather than flat racing is that we do have these stars that we can follow year after year. Again, I'm going to talk about St. Mark's Basilica, who looks like he might now be missing. But... With the flat, it's a very fleeting experience, whereas over jumps, we get to know these horses, their traits, their preferences over a period of several years rather than several weeks. Ed, what's your view when you try and do form, as we, we talk about on a regular basis? You like to, to find a horse for a big race, you know, months in advance and, and hope they get there. You did successfully well with Hurricane Lane for the St. Ledger. But when you're trying to do form for perhaps some of these big feature races, whether it be the Cheltenham Festival or other, how do you look at it when you're seeing so many of the established stars move on? Are you looking for an emerging talent? How do you assess the form in that regard? Yeah, a tricky question that Shane's answer in such a concise period of time. But uh, generally speaking, um, I do like to look for the 
the, the kind of the dark horses, although slightly under the radar, which naturally dovetail with finding a horse anti post at a bigger price. And I all, I'm always slightly uh, wary of those horses who had really hard battles at Cheltenham, perhaps uh, in defeat. And it often, as a lot of trainers have said, if they have a really hard race or soft ground, it can take a few runs to get them back or even a season to get them back. So, um, I mean, that's why the record, I think Quarto Star, of course, was the first horse to regain a Cheltenham Gold Cup. But running in some of those Grey One races, especially at the back end of the season at those festivals, including Cheltenham, it can leave a mark on the horses. And that's why kind of tradition and history has said uh, that, you know, the up-and-comers nose coming through in the fresh angle is definitely one to side with. Having said that, you then do get the kind of standout champions, which kind of defy that statistic. And year after year, rules there or thereabouts and end up being multiple festival winners. So, yeah, as Jamie Stone, I think the trainer said the other day, said at this stage of the season, uh, every horse in every yard in the country is a grey one winner at the Cheltenham Festival because um, no one's been proven wrong yet. It's an exciting time. <laughs> really looking forward to it. All hopes and dreams of owners and connections are still intact. And, yeah, as we say, it'll always be that blend of the emerging stars coming through, uh, Shishkin, probably leading the like the established stars, probably Honey Suckle and, and Manella Indo, probably the, the two in the Henry de Bromhead team, uh, which we're looking forward to. And of course, William Mullins says, likes of Appreciate It, Kill Cri-. I mean, look, so many emerging uh, mm. stars on the scene. It will be, it should be set up for, we're only kind of two or three weeks now before the jump season gets properly going in earnest, as I would say, uh, a month out from the first Cheltenham, Fest- uh, Cheltenham meeting as well. So yeah, lots to look forward to in the National Hunt scene. Well, the way you've both talked about that, I think that's going to set us a task for next week's show. I need you both to come up with three horses for the national hunt season that you think are worthy of us following. So no pressure, guys. Find three. Could be hurdlers, could be chasers, could be bumper horses, whatever. But let's try and find some horses that we think will really emerge for season uh, 2021 into 2022. Let's talk about the whip issue. It seems to be an issue that never goes too far away when it comes to racing. Uh, Stephen, I'll start with you because... Well, the general public, there seems to be a really negative perception about, uh, perception about the whip being used in, in horse racing. There's a bit of a push emerging through some media outlets and particularly some industry bodies saying maybe we should change the name of the whip, whether you call it a persuader or other. Do you think this is just a waste of time? Is it the fact that there's still an apparatus where a jockey is waving it against a horse or, or using it on a horse? It's the problem. Well, I think this is more navel gazing, Shane, isn't it? Or fiddling while Rome burns, or whatever, all these cliches you can say. Um, my honest opinion is the general public don't care two monkeys about a whip. It never crosses anybody's mind. You're either interested in horse racing, go once a year, go once a decade, or you go two or three times a week, or every Saturday. You're not going to change anything, whether you call it a pro cush, a whip. Uh, you know, it doesn't make any difference. The good thing that's happened over the last decade, 20 years or so, is that the whip that used to be made of leather and cause some kind of pain to horses is now a very soft, lightweight device that basically it's not the actual impact of the flick with a whip um, that causes horses to run faster. It's the noise and it just motivates them, creates a tiny bit of, ang- not anxiety, but of fear um, to, to drive them forwards or to correct them or make them run straight. Or And if you speak to most jockeys who are the ones who have to use them after all, that most, nearly all of them think it's a pretty essential piece of kit. So it's not something, we invite trouble in, don't we, by talking about it. I think we should just get on with it. It's been modified quite rightly. Um, I don't think it should be talked about or discussed because it's unhelpful. The, the people who want racing banned, uh, the whip's neither here nor there. It's going to pacify anyone by calling it something different. Ed, do you have a, a similar view or is it something that the industry really needs to look at and, and make either further significant change as Stephen mentioned it has been evolved um the the use of the whip in racing over the past 20 years but does more need to be done well racing just seems to get you know habitually scared by inverted commas the outside world doesn't it on on so many issues and to be honest with you i just think this is a there's a million and one things racing should be trying to fix first uh regardless of the the fact, you know, somebody who tunes in to watch racing three times a year might get offended by the use of the word whip. I, I just just think, yeah, it's all a bit of a waste of time, really. It, it is what it is. I mean, there's so many other sports, you know, you can go to golf and get hit by a golf ball. I mean, what are you going to do, ban spectators? There's people nearly uh, getting serious injuries in, in F1 cars. But, you know, it, it kind of is what it is. You know, I, I don't see a big... Um, 
kind of BHA equivalent committee for the F1 season all getting together to find out what public perception should be on, on you know, car accidents and everything. So just get on with it, for crying out loud. Uh, as Stephen says, if you're not interested on in horse racing, uh, you would call it a whip, a cushion, a mounty castle, whatever you want to call it. It's really not going to make much of a, of, of a difference, to be honest with you. Uh, you're either interested in racing, uh, accounted for the use of the whip uh, by whatever name you go by, or you're not. Like, I can't see how... Um, changing the name per se is, I mean, it may, it may soften the blow, excuse the pun, for a, a very small percentage of people uh, in in that kind of perception angle. But again, as I said, the only people who moan about racing are not on a day to day basis. It's the Grand National, it's sometimes at Cheltenham and, and the Derby. It's three or four times a year the anti racing brigade actually care about anything. Uh, I just think we just, just shut up moaning about stuff and just, just get on with the sport and look at the other areas which actually need fixing on, like dodgy photo finishes and prize money. Fair point. Let's focus on one run of success which has been quite extraordinary throughout uh, this year, and that has been, again, the solidification of Godolphin at the top of the tree when it comes to global racing powerhouses. Uh, Stephen and Ed, I mean, we've, we've talked about their success this year numerous times on Jump To It. But it's fascinating. It doesn't matter where they're setting their horses for, Stephen. They're getting great results. They were in Canada for the Group 1 meetings or Grade 1 meetings this past weekend. They've walked away with trainer Charlie Appleby and actually linking up with former Godolphin leading rider Frankie Dettori, winning three Grade 1s. It's remarkable how they've got the system flowing once again and the winners are coming everywhere. Absolutely, Shane. I mean, they had those dismal few years, didn't they? Barely had a decent horse. They're really struggling. I think... They had a strike rate under sort of 10% for many years, uh, you know, struggling to make any impact in all the group races. They were still sending horses all around the world and they were just not taking part. But the key is Charlie Appleby, I think. I mean, he's had an amazing season. I was looking over the last fortnight at him because um, he seems to sort of have a winner every time you look up. And he's, I think he's around 39% winners. And, and I think for the whole season, he's in, in the high 20s, which is pretty incredible. All right, he's got a lot of top class horses running in the sent Dittori over, didn't they? I think to Canada at last weekend, age 50. He just turns up, rides the tracks brilliant. He kind of ridden the tracks more than once or twice in his life, these, some of these places. Um, Buick was sort of joking that uh, uh, Frankie phoned him up to thank him for the birthday present uh, to, let, to let him go over there. Of course, Buick's trying to win the championship. He's about 10 behind Murphy at the moment. So Dittori got to go over there. And it, it was a fantastic... Uh, spectacle and it's great for British racing really that these horses are upholding the sort of form all around the world. I think we'll talk more about Frankie and, and William Buick in particular and Ashim Murphy shortly but Ed I, I want to get your views on as Stephen referenced Charlie Appleby's influence with Godolphin. I think when you look at the Godolphin operation uh, Sheikh Mohammed and, and all involved are wanting to win races it's not necessarily just about getting a horse to get the right CV to then be retired to stud they love to have their horses. So for every uh, Group 1 winning colt, they tend to have a, a Group 1 winning seven-year-old gelding going around. It's a vastly different strategy to perhaps what we see with Coolmore and certainly with some of the other big operations. Do you put Charlie Appleby, though, right at the heart of this successful run that they're having? Absolutely. You'd have to, wouldn't you, Shane? I mean, you made some good points about the way the Godolphin uh, horses are generally throughout a career campaign, which would alter to Ballydor. But yeah, uh, to touch upon what Stephen said, you go back seven, eight years ago, Godolphin, a really dark place, weren't they? they you had the whole Mahmoud al uh saga mm. going on and uh, everything. Godolphin could not buy a winner. Some of these... 300 400 grand good things were dropping out the back of the television on the all weather and it was a it was a big worry charlie appleby's come along and it really had i mean what he's done there is just quite remarkable when steven touched upon the stats uh, i mean this season he's, he's touching 30 percent for a whole season september he, he's touching 40 percent the the yard are absolutely flying and yeah you've got to contribute a lot of success to him because the he really has taken godolphin back up to new level and if you take kind of snowfall and uh, St. Mark's Basilica out the equation, you, you're pretty much uh, with Team Godolphin this season, haven't they? They've been rejuvenated. And even Sai Bin Saror, who, uh, a trainer who'd gone through a bit of a, a quiet spell, he's starting to bang the winners in, in again, isn't he? And he's, of course, he's got real world who's a really exciting type. And yeah, the, everything just feels good about the Godolphin kind of setup at the moment. And yeah, you, I mean, I'm not privy enough to know a lot about the inside workings of the Charlie Appleby team, but the just look at the raw numbers and the data. Uh, whatever Charlie Appleby's doing, he's doing it very well because the, the numbers are just pretty much phenomenal. 
Yeah, and you think about their successful run, uh, it's certainly not just uh, in the UK, uh, France, where they've got a stable as well. Uh, in Ireland, every time they seem to send a horse over, they won a group one there the other week. Uh, the United States, they're flying <laughs> through Dubai with their, their main carnivals. They yep. seem to win every major race. And of course, they have great success with um, <coughs> excuse me, James Cummings as their um, trainer in Australia. It's a phenomenal setup. I want to bring in Frankie Dottori, though. It was great seeing him back in the all blue, Stephen, winning those grade ones for Godolphin because so much of his career and his success has been attached to Godolphin. But there's a bit of a mindset change with Frankie now that he's well into his 50s. He's very much a gun for hire. He's ridden Group 1s for Coolmore and Aidan O'Brien this year, including Snowfall. He's certainly partnering up with Godolphin. He's had the great association with uh, Prince Khaled Abdullah and, and, and Judmont, uh, of course, and, and the Gosdens. He's in a really unique position, which you don't often find for a jockey towards the end of their career, if we be blunt about it. Once a jockey gets into their 50s, there's usually perhaps five to maybe 10 years max that they're still going to be riding at the elite level. Mm. But he's in a really special position now for that latter part of his career, where basically he's picking and choosing the type of horses he wants to ride. Absolutely. So, I mean, he's a, a terrific, like you, he's a really good advert for 50 year old plus, isn't he? You know, he's at the height of his powers. <laughs> no comment. Still going strong. <laughs> but to be fair to the Tory, he has chosen quality over quantity for the last five or six years. You know, he's not buzz. I mean, they can't ride at two meetings anymore, but he's not put knocking his pipe out to ride 10 horses a day and then, fl you know, fly back up north, back to Newmarket and then out again at five in the morning. He cherry picks his rides and he's cherry picking them brilliantly. The thing about the tour is he just keeps doing it. He's so consistent. I mean, I can think of two rides really in the last six or so. I think he was very ordinary on Stradivarius at Royal Ascot, but perhaps he wouldn't have won anywhere. And I thought he went to sleep on snowfall in France the other day. But other than that, um, he does everything right. I mean, he went over to Canada at the weekend, as I say, a track he's probably got no ex great experience of right. He rode it like he's ridden it a thousand times in the right place, quick and clear. Thank you and good night. He's just a top class horseman. And I hope he stays around for a few more years. I mean, I think Lester Piggott was well into his mid 50s, wasn't he? He came back in America and won the big race in America in um, the 50s, I think. And uh, Tory can do the same. He's probably the best thing that's happened to UK flat racing in the last 20 years, to be honest, because he, he is a genuine household name and the, the sport's desperately crying out for them. Yeah, I think uh, Stephen touches on a good point there, Ed, in that Frankie Dottori is one of those names in racing that actually would be understood by people who would normally read the front end of the paper where the big news is just as readily as they'd go to the back end of the paper where they'd read sport. I mean, he's got a name that covers all, all forms of society, his success and his... Uh, I suppose his character, the way that he, he can put on a show, has really put him at the top of the tree. But it is, as I touched on earlier, it is quite remarkable, though. We don't often see a jockey at this age or at this stage of their career still possessing that drive, that ambition and that pulling power that Frankie's got. Yeah, indeed. Uh, fantastic jockey. Yeah, into his 50s now, but keeps himself incredibly fit. And um, as you say, kind of... A character where you can, you can he's, he's earned the luxury to do what he wants, is basically, isn't he? And I suppose it's going to add, it's going to allow him to elongate his career. The fact that he's not going to be burnt out by doing these 10, 12 rides a day and jumping between two meetings. Uh, as you say, he kind of turns up for the big checks, the big days. He seems to be riding as well as ever. And it's just a pleasure to absolutely watch him, isn't it? Um, I, I think, yeah, Stephen's right. I think Lester Piggott, I think, was 55 when he he came back at the uh, at the Breeders' Cup. And, yeah, to Tory would not be a shock if he was uh, nearer 60 than 50 when he decided to hang up his boots. Because in terms of his physical condition, there doesn't seem to be any deterioration there. He says he's got no issues with his weight. Uh, his health seems to get a clean bullet in touch wood. So, yeah, Frankie to Tory. Um, uh, the first point you touched upon in terms of his... His kind of his, his selling point to the wider public. He has always been a very popular figure, one of the most charismatic sports individuals you'd find across any uh, type of sport, and that's why I think has endeared him to the public. He he kind of really you know the flying dismounts and his charismatic interviews. Uh, the public really kind of binds that, and uh, of course he's been on reality TV shows over here in the UK as well. So he does have that kind of. X factor away from the saddle, which uh, especially with the the younger generations, uh, even though he is touching fifty, at times you feel like you're talking to someone, uh, you know, uh, twenty years younger. He seems to be quite in touch mm. with what's going on in that in that in that sense of things. So yeah, to Tory riding at the top of his game. I mean, you won't pull the wall over the eyes of the top, the, the top trainers. You know, there won't be any kind of sentiment about oh. 
uh, with Frankie Dettori. Oh, he used to be able to do this, used to be able to do that. The, as soon as he goes over the hill, the, the racing world can be very ruthless. But there seems to be no sign of decline on the big stage from Dettori at the moment. And as I said, he's pound for pound, riding as good as anyone. And uh, he's, the, he's the go-to person uh, in the wearing room still. Question without notice for both of you then. If you owned a horse that is a Group 1 horse that is going into a Group 1 race the best it possibly can be from a training perspective, what jockey would you book? Stephen, I'll start with you. Oh, that is a good, um, I'd say Holly Doyle, to be honest. I think she's absolutely brilliant judge of pace and she makes no mistakes, That honestly. Um, and she's completely worthy, reliable, strong in a finish. You know, I, I can't remember her giving a horse a bad ride all, all, all summer, to be honest. It's a good push for Holly Doyle. What about you, Ed? Who would you book? That's very much Frankie de Tory on the big occasion, a Royal Ascot good thing or an odds on shot in Newmarket or still de Tory for the the big the big race, the big, you know, the, the X factor kind of contest. Ryan Moore for his strength in the finish. I still think he gets a lot of unfair stick, Ryan Moore, perhaps for, more for his kind of um, laconic interviews rather than his riding mm. prowess. But um, Ryan Moore still in the finish when the chips are down, I like to have on my side. But yeah, Frankie Dettori in a group one, be it the Ark or Breeders' Cup or whatever, uh, he would still be the person I, I would go to for the big race. Neither of you mentioned Asheen Murphy and William Buick who are in this ding-dong battle yeah. for the, the jockey's title in, uh, in the UK. It's been fascinating watch throughout the season. Stephen, uh, as you touched on earlier, um, Asheen's got a, a bit of a lead still over William as he's out to defend his title. Do you think he'll win it again? Or can William Buick, with the power of Godolphin behind him, perhaps come over the top mm. and win the title? Well, I mean, th it's a fascinating... But I think he's about 10 in front, Asheen, isn't he? I mean... Buick's going to be on a lot of short-priced horses in Maidens as we get to the back end of the season, Shane. They've got all these horses stored up. They always run them. The only thing is um, they're going to be in huge fields. We often get, as, as the ground finally eases, they, a lot of horses out for a run, not many of them fancy. But I would have thought Buick is going to probably be on a lot more short-priced horses than mm. I've seen Murphy. Murphy rides for more trainers, and he's on a lot of fancied horses. But they tend to be in the sort of competitive five to one the field handicaps rather than five to two on the when there's no trials again. But it's going to be a really good battle. I would think Murphy must be quite long odds on favourite with that lead of 10, plus the fact he's going to ride, try and ride seven horses every day um, till the season ends, whereas Buick perhaps um, has to cherry pick um, his rides more carefully. But fascinating. Really, it's brought it alive a bit, actually, because they're both exceptionally good jockeys. We're blessed to have them both riding. Ed, what's your view? Can uh, William Buick take the crown? I think it's unlikely. Uh, however, I, we, we can play this back and I'll get egg on my face. But I think by the end of it, I think Buick will sh narrow the gap without winning it, if you see what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with Stephen. I was just looking through the Godolphin entries for the next five, six days. A whole host of these um, things that cost nine million running in two-year-old maidens. <laughs> and those races, that, you know, there's some incredibly well-bred, unexposed two-year-olds that are going to come out and go off short prices. And uh, some big group ones still, uh, which Buick's going to be having some some pretty good rides on. on just on a side point, we should actually touch. Uh, Hurricane Lane's been given the green light for the Arc to Triumph uh, this morning, which poses a really interesting question for Buick uh, on a side issue. Does he go Adair or Hurricane Lane? I suppose that's one for another day. But um, yeah, I think, I think Murphy will hold on but I think he's kind of he's got 10 lengths ahead and he's going to just get over the line I think you could come with a late rattle but as you said uh, to build up a buffer of 10 uh, when Murphy's riding se getting 7 or 8 rides a day um, for, for a lot of yards uh, it's going to be hard to rope in that deficit now I think One uh, point I do want to touch on before we, we move on and focus on the upcoming races we're seeing in Ireland Colin Keane's got a massive uh, lead over his rival Shane Foley's uh, in second position but Colin Keane his emergence as a star jockey over the past few years has been quite outstanding. Uh, I think no matter what he decides to do in the years to come, Stephen, uh, whether it's to remain in Ireland or potentially uh, do more riding in, in the UK or even uh, in, in other parts of Europe when the big meetings are on, I think he's destined to be considered one of the true great riders globally. Do you have that similar view? Yeah, I mean, he's incredibly talented and prolific and he, he hasn't had the massive stables behind him from the start. I mean, th there have been rumours in Ireland about Ryan Moore and Bally Doyle for quite a long time now. I remember a couple of years, someone who usually gets things right telling me this was his last season, they'd sort of had enough. He, he did, had made a few mistakes. He didn't have a wonderful Royal Ascot, Ryan Moore, to be honest. I don't think they were that thrilled with him there. So there's probably going to be a very, very big race, uh, a vacancy 
at the top of Irish racing. And there's certainly two or three very promising young riders who could be fighting for that, that perch when it becomes available. Yeah, I think uh, it's a really good point that you make. Um, where do you see him uh, playing a part in perhaps some of the biggest stables in Europe in the, the, the next few years, Ed? Do you think he could perhaps become uh, the number one jockey for uh, Coolmore and Ballydore? In time, yes. I think it's uh, totally feasible, isn't it, really? All you've got to weigh in the age factors, you know, what Ryan Moore's 38. You look at he's just turned 27, Colin Keane. So time definitely on his side, especially if you compare him to like Sir Kevin Manning and uh, Frankie the Tour. He's got a quarter of a century still to go at the top level. So, <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, he's a jockey who really has... Um, wouldn't have been a name on many people's lips, even perhaps three, four years ago, to be blunt, as uh, uh, a, a, a horse racing fan. But he really is just, his numbers are terrific. Uh, riding out of his skin, uh, some much better judges than myself from a technical point of view say he really is up there with the best they've seen in Ireland for many of a year. And yeah, I mean, he's got a pretty good job at the moment, but you do kind of get the feeling there will be a, a, a kind of a mega bucks option at, at some point in the future, because you say he's definitely got time on his side and he's, he's riding right at the top of his game. All right, guys, it's now time to focus on some of the upcoming races for the week ahead. And, of course, uh, the famous uh, Cambridge Show meeting at Newmarket has commenced, and we're going to focus principally on Saturday because Saturday's card is simply outstanding, and we'll start with the uh, Group 2 Judmont Royal Lodge Stakes. Now, this is for two-year-olds over a mile, and we've got seven horses to face a starter. We start with uh, Caribus for uh, Godolphin, uh, Charlie Appleby and William Buick. Currently around 7-2 with Bet365. Houth, the son of uh, Churchill for Adno Bryan's at 12-1. to Masakila, Sheen Murphy, Andrew Balding, 5-2. to two. Uh, Certainly a, a big chance in this. One for the gutter. Strange name. Great name, in fact. 20-1, to yeah. one, James Doyle in the saddle. Royal Patronage at 9-2. to two. Seattle King is at 20-1. to one. An unconquerable Another son of Churchill, Donica O'Brien and Frankie Dottori combining there. We talked about Frankie earlier at 20 to 1. Field of seven for the Royal Lodge. Stephen, what are you doing from a form perspective here? Well, I think the weak link in the chain here, Shane, which I always like as a punter, it's good to attack a race by finding one you really, really don't fancy. And that, that one is Royal Patronage of Mark Johnson. He's won a couple of races from the front at Epsom and at York. This is a completely different track. Um, I don't think he's good enough. I think the other two, Caribus, who is extremely impressive first time out in Newmarket for Charlie Appleby. But for me, the clear form choice is Massacala of Andrew Balding. Has only run one ordinary race, really, at Royal Ascot and on the wrong side of the track. Got beat uh, on the nod by Native Trail, is Frank the form since. And then at Newbury last time, I was absolutely mortified because Bayside Boy got nutted by Massacala right on the line. Um, that is particularly strong form. Bayside Boy has come out and franked it at Doncaster, beating Reach for the Moon. is a very useful horse. Masakala is a scrapper, a battler, has got a very good make makeup here because Royal Patronage will go off hard. And I suspect Caribus, who made most of the running on debut, will probably try and be up there as well. And I can see Masakala swooping late. I suspect this might be a race where opinions might differ. Um, I was looking at sort of six to four Massacala, and I think you might get at least two to one um, on Saturday because there will be a market for the second and third indefinitely. So Massacala for me, I think this is going to be a very good day for us in Murphy at Newmarket on Saturday. All right, Massacala to start the day off well for Sheen. What are you doing, Ed? Yeah, I'll be with Massacala too. Um, echo a lot of what Stephen said. The Native Trail and the Bayside Boy, uh, both those horses are frank to form in no uncertain terms by uh, landing really big pots, haven't they? And uh, the other point with Masakila would be the trip. It looked a very strong stare at the seven furlongs mm. last time out in Newbury. The natural progression looks to be going up to mile here. Uh, a lot of stamina in this one's pedigree. I think 10 furlongs next season's uh, going to be well within this one's grasp. So, yeah, uh, Masakila for Andrew Balding, who's had a stunning season. Uh, Oshin Murphy on board. Of course, we're talking about Murphy and Buick. And, of course, we're going to have these two going head-to-head -head, uh, in the, in this contest here, aren't we, with Kribus and Masakila. So, yeah, Masakila for me got the form in the book. And I think there's more to come over a mile. So, uh, yeah, big nod from me here. No, it's a race historically that tends to work out a decent form reference. Let's hope we get a similar scenario from this year's running, despite the fact we've got a fairly small field. All right, let's go on to the first of the uh, group ones on the card. And this is for the two-year-old fillies, the Judmont Cheveley Park Stakes. Six furlongs, and we've got 13 fillies to face the starter. We start with uh, Corazon, last start, third place getter in the Flying Childers, William Buick riding at 12-1. to one. Desert Dreamer, Sheen Murphy uh, in the saddle at 12-1. to one. 
Eve Lodge is at 16 for Jamie Spencer. Flotus, good winner last start, currently 13 to 2 with James Doyle. Gilded at 33 to 1. Have a good day at 20 to 1. Illustrating is currently at 14 to 1. Uh, the unbeaten Sacred Bridge is at 7 to 4. Uh, Colin Keane for Girl Lions. Sandrine at 4 to 1. Uh, Tenebrism at 10 to 1. Ryan Moore and Aidan O'Brien. Thunder Love at 25 to 1. Velocidad's also at 25 to 1. Zane Claudette, impressive winning last start currently at 4 to 1. I think it's a fantastic field, Stephen. There's not really many fillies that you're sort of thinking should be there but aren't. I think it's going to be a really competitive race. Now, this is a brilliant race. Here. This is all the best form lines of all the fillies, juvenile fillies the whole, over the whole summer in Britain and Ireland, really. The favourite Sacred Bridge has been really impressive. If you're going to be sort of nitpicky, you can say that the horses she's been beaten haven't done a lot for the form. She beat Bosch very narrowly, who's since been beaten, and she beat Geocentric impressively, who's since got beaten a listed race at, at air. So it's not gilt-edged, the form, and she's under 2-1 to one at the moment. I think Sandrine sets the standard, certainly for the UK horses, but the one I like um, is closely matched with Sandrine is Desert Dreamer of Stuart Williams. Now, she's been on the go for most of the summer. She's been kept busy. She won her first two starts at Newmarket on the other course. She's run really well every single time since. If you watch the run back in the Lowther at York last time, her saddle went in the last 100 yards. I don't think it would make any great difference, but it definitely slipped, and she was right up on the hammer throughout whereas Sandrine came from a long way off a very strong pace. So I think Dreamer, who's 14 to 1, which probably means she's at least 20 on the exchanges, is definitely one to have winning. I don't think she'll be far away. And one thing we haven't mentioned, Shane, um, the ground at Newmarket to start Thursday is, is good, basically, but the weather forecast is dry and sunny. So I've sort of made all my selections thinking it's ground Saturday afternoon. OK, uh, good point. And I think it, it's uh, a good case you make for Desert Dreamer. She's proven herself to be a pretty much a bomb-proof filly. Uh, she's been up and racing mm. since April. Uh, her only probably negative performance was uh, on one occasion. That was a Royal Ascot. You can make excuses for that. Uh, I should say you can make mm. excuses for that. So she just could be that good each-way option as your highlight. Ed, what's your view? Yeah, I can never seem to get these uh, Joe Lyons horses right at all. And this Sacred Bridge, bridge unbeaten, looks the part. Went very nice in the Group 3. It seems as you could pick holes in that form a little bit. Um, I'll be tempted to look away here. I mean, Sandrine, St. Claudette, obviously not much between them last time out with um, Desert Dreamer at York. I get a feeling St. Claudette possibly got the run of the race on that occasion. Um, I, I don't think it's probably a lot split, those. Mm. Um, are those double-figure prices? Uh, Flotus is interesting. Now, they totally changed the tactics last time out uh, made all uh, the horse had been quite a keen individual who liked to, they tried to hold up from off the pace and come through and those tactics have just not been working uh, they just let floaters just bomb off in front last time out and it was pretty impressive so with a change of tactics and that one can go well at double figure price and we touched upon the um the fact that, that t Team Coolmore have had a slightly uh, underwhelming season in some regards. And yeah, Tenor Brism, though, is, is a double figure price here. Ryan Moore in the saddle won an ace maiden, but did so in really smart style over the five furlongs. Power clear in the closing stages. Steps up to six for this. Uh, she's an exciting Caravaggio filly. So, uh, yeah, I'd probably, I'll probably i be interested in a couple here at double-figure prices. Uh, likes of Flotus and Tenebrism, uh, if they're in the shake-up, it, it wouldn't surprise me at all if either of those managed to uh, get the job done here. It's a, it's a fiercely competitive account to this one. Yeah, I don't mind that push you've just given for Tenebrism out of a pivotal mare. That's always a good uh, sign from my perspective when you see the pivotal mares. I know uh, Vincent from uh, irishracing.com highlighted that during uh, Royal Ascot. So certainly at the, the price you both found... Uh, couple of prospects at decent prices there that we uh, could get some uh, decent runs for our money. Let's move on to the next of the Group 1s, and this is the Judmont Middle Park Stakes. Again, uh, six furlongs, 1,200 metres, and we have a field of 10. Armour for Pat Dobbs and Richard Hannon, currently at 6 to 1. Asymmetric, Martin Harley and Alan King, you're getting 13 to 2. Castle Star, the son of Star Spangled Banner, at 8 to 1. Jamie Spencer in the saddle. Katura is at 10 to 1 uh, for uh, Adam Kirby. Dr. Zemp, Colin Keane in the saddle at 9 to 2. Go Bears Go at 8 to 1. HMS Endeavour, uh, last start winner, very impressive on that occasion at 14 to 1. New York City at 25s. Perfect Power at 7 to 4. Twilight Jet currently at 20 to 1. While I have a drink of water, Stephen, give us your views. I think this is very tight, Shane. Perfect Power sets the standard. The pre morning winner. Uh, on pretty soft ground, impressively quickening up smartly, almost from last to first. But the one I like at the prices is four times the price of Perfect Power, and they're very closely matched, and that's Richard Hannon's 
Armour. Now, this one was sent off on the Paris Mutual favourite to beat Perfect Power in the Prix Mornay. Not much went right for Pat Dobbs that day. Didn't see a lot of daylight. Um, beaten a couple of lengths by Perfect Power. You're now getting, I think for looking, there's nine to one, maybe ten to one about Armour, who is really impressive at Goodwood in a race that I do think is very solid form, quickening up against the stands rail on soft ground. Now, some people seem to think Armour wants soft ground, but I'm not convinced by that. When he won on debut at Doncaster, it was pretty firm and he travelled really strongly. I think the key with Armour is he was beaten at a short price last time out, but that was back at five furlongs. And I think he's ready for six. He's already proven himself that that suits, especially on fast ground. I think he's an uncomplicated finder, a strong galloper, and I think he'll give you a good run for your money. Particularly, again, it's about prices, Shane, isn't it? Perfect powers, 15 to 8, 2 to 1, and Armour's probably 8 or 9 to 1. I don't think there's that much between them. The gap in the market is too wide. Yeah, again, you've made a really positive case for a horse at a decent price there. Ed, what's your view for the middle park? An absolute head scratcher, Shane, if I'm being blunt, isn't mm. it? I mean, if you look at the Phoenix Stakes from last time out, Dr. Zemp, Castle Star, Go Bears Go, what, just over a length between them, and you can make excuses for a couple of those in behind. Uh, asymmetric, I mean, perfect power, yeah, sets the standard, won the pre morning last time out, and we'll see that form tested by Trident, who's due to run soon as well. So, um, Head scratching, horrible race from a betting point of view. I, 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 some of these, uh, the other thing as well is the back end of the season, some of these have just cried enough um, after busy campaigns. You never quite know what's left in the tank. And um, you can see a few of these horses like inexplicably just run flat just because they've had four or five runs in the last space of the last seven, eight weeks. And, that, and that's just enough for these une unexposed types. So, uh, yeah. Um, race I'm going to sit out definitely with the view to the future and some note taking but uh, I think Perfect Power is the right favourite uh, whether the horse will win or not I'm not entirely sure Okay fair points you make there I might just have to have something on HMS Endeavour uh, which was uh, named in honour of the ship that uh, James Cook Captain James Cook sailed from uh, England to Australia back in 1770 so <laughs> just got to find a way to bring Australia into every conversation yeah. guys yeah. Right. the big betting race in in many respects of the day is the bet 365 Cambridgeshire handicap one of the great handicap races that we have uh, anywhere in the world it's run over a mile and one furlong or 1800 meters and well we've got 35 horses plus two <laughs> reserves to get through guys let's whip through it we start with Bell Rock who'll be carrying the top weight for Andrew Balding 40 to 1 Magical Mornings at 14 to 1, Frankie Dettori in the saddle for John Gosden. Majestic Dawns at 20s for William Buick. Raise You at 25 to 1. Royal Marine, uh, Pat Cosgrove, Saeed Bin Sora, always dangerous when they combine at 16s. Bedouin Story at 40 to 1. Mari's Diamonds at 40 to 1. Indeed's at 20 to 1, Ben Curtis taking the ride. Astro Kings at 10s for Ryan Moore. Uncle Brins at 4 to 1, certainly the market leader, Rap Havlin for John Gosden. Ropey Guest at 50 to 1, Tom Queeley. Dan Stupiders at 14s for James Doyle. Breath Court at 33 to 1. Irish Admirals at 16 to 1 for Tom Marquard. Ray Dawson takes a ride on Montafa at 16s. Lacanders at 25s. Hartswood uh, at 66 to 1. Power of Darkness at 50 to 1. Fantastic Fox at 14s. Anything Today at 25. Spirit Dancer Jason Hart riding at 20s. Good Birthday at 40 to 1 for Asheen Murphy. Big prize for the champion jockey. Trey Fleur at 100 to 1, Fastnet Crown at 33 to 1, and Mart at 11 to 1 for Jim Crowley. Amethyst uh, David Probert on a 25 to 1 chance. Your Hyde at 66 to 1. Chichester, Holly Doyle, uh, Stephen's favourite jockey at 9 to 1. Long Tradition at 18 to 1. Naval Commander at uh, 66 to 1. Epic Endeavours at 80 to 1. We're almost there. Zosimus at 25 to 1. Data Protection at 66s. Planter Dream at 100 to 1. John Baptiste at 100 to 1. Now we'll have a look at the two reserves. Glentanus is currently at 100 to 1. And Baltic Baron, no price quoted at this stage. But there we have it. A great race each and every year, guys. Stephen, from a betting perspective, what do you do? Well, 35 runners, Shane. As we say every week, play each way. Bookmakers will be offering six. You might find seven or eight places for looking around if you've got the accounts. And they're the ones to try and to use. There's been a phantom gamble, hasn't there, this week? Uncle Bryn has been double figures and was down as short as seven to two. I did see one bookmaker's rep saying he thought it might go off two to one. Uh, well, I've got a bit of eight to one to go if anyone wants any of that. It'll be at least eight to one the field on the day. Um, Detori's actually chosen the other one and Hav Havlin's on the current favourite 
Uncle Bryn. He's going to be a big drifter if he isn't already. But by the time the race comes around, I'd be slightly surprised if he was favourite. I think he's got plenty to find. Other than that, it's a very, very hard race. The one I think is the most interesting, uh, and I can make the best case for anyway, is Fantastic Fox of Roger Varian. Um, he's been ridden by Sylvester de Souza, all runs in handicaps. He's had four handicaps so far, settled him on any occasion. He's got loads of ability. I think he's probably six or seven pounds better than his rating if he ever settles. Um, he's run on soft ground twice. He did win at Haydock despite pulling hard, and he ran a lot better than the bear result last time, again failing to settle for de Souza. You've got Andrea Atsaini taking over. The ground's going to be a lot faster than he's raced on, which I'm hoping is a real positive. He's 16 to 1. There's more improvement to come. The key is, obviously, 35 runners. They're going to, you know, go an absolute mad gallop. So if he doesn't settle in this, he never will. Um, so I think he'll come through late and go very close. Of course, you could be right in this race, Shane, and be on the wrong side of the track. Um, or you could see no daylight, finish eighth. Um, it's a really, really hard race. A brilliant spectacle, but I think it's at least 10 to 1 the field. And Fantastic Fox, 16 to 1, five places. Look around for six, seven, eight places. He's the one for me. A good push for the son of Frankel by uh, Stephen. Fantastic Fox is around 16 to 1. Ed, uh, my father would always say a race like this is a dartboard job. It means you put the, the form guide up on the dartboard. You just throw a dart and wherever <laughs> it lands. That's what you bet on. What are you doing in the race? Yep, the uh, equine roulette, as I like to call it. Yeah, this one, this is, uh, oh, goodness sake. I mean, we've seen all sorts of chaos in this race. And we had a 40 to 1 winner last year, a 50 to 1 winner a couple of seasons ago, even a 100 to 1 winner back in 2004. I think Lord North was favourite uh, and won this. But generally speaking, you can get all sorts of carnage in here, which uh, in part makes it fun. And, and as Stephen says, you can get some big price winners, you can get some each way value. And But look, for goodness sake, uh, you could get drawn in the car park here and your race is over by the time the, ra uh, the race has started. And the fact is, you won't even know which side uh, you want to be on before it starts, if you're looking, especially from anti-post terms. So, look, my tentative pick would be a horse called Long Tradition. We talked about the revival Team Godolphin. My side, Bin Soror, is mob-handed here. But this Long Tradition, uh, interesting run. In fact, the horse has not made it to the racetrack until the age of four. So, obviously, persevered a lot with this horse at home uh, from an early stage. has been gelded. Uh, had to just have a shake of the reins to win at Chelmsford last time out in a minor event. Um, obviously, this is a totally different kettle fish altogether, but goes handicapping off a mark of 90s, totally unexposed, and looks to be, as I said, is a bit of a late bloomer and looks to be progressing. So, could be anything off a mark of 90. Marco Gianni's had a great season. He's in the saddle uh, as much as you can be in a, a race of this nature. I thought around the 20 to 1 mark, that horse would probably get my, my small each way ticket. But uh, uh, normally, by and large, a, a race I swerve. Fair enough. Let's move on to the Curra. On Saturday, we've got a race that often proves to be a significant form reference for the following season, three-year-old features. And this is the Bereford Stakes this year. Uh, Brought to you as the Alan Smurf at Memorial Bereford Stakes at Group 2 level. Now, we've only got a field of six here for the mile contest, but it's a really good field, I think. Uh, Johnny Murtar settles up Chicago Soldier. Uh, Luxembourg, the son of Camelot for Aidan O'Brien, Shami Heffernan riding. Manowek Cord, uh, Kevin Menning and Jim Bolger, the son of Tiafilo. Piz Badil, uh, Donica O'Brien, uh, is settling up the son of Ulysses. Swan Bay, good reports about this, the son of Australia for Joseph O'Brien. And To Wake, uh, for Joe Lyons, uh, the son of Elzam. So only a field of six, Stephen, but I think there's a bit of talent in this lineup, and I think there will be horses that we'll be seeing mentioned as legitimate derby contenders next year come through it. Yeah, definitely, Shane. It's a very informative race, not one I've got a strong opinion form-wise about, but one to watch and make notes. Um, the one you mentioned, Swan Bay, I did watch him win at Galway this morning, and that was a really devastating performance. He was hammering tongs with Anchorage, his market rival, at a really fast pace. I know they do go bananas around Galway, but he sustained it. He was under pressure two furlongs out, and you thought, well, he could be in trouble here, but he picked up strongly and absolutely flew home, and they were strung out all over Galway and behind. So he's the one I'm most interested in. Uh, when we see the price, we haven't got a market formed yet, I don't think, but uh, he's the one I'm most interested in. The moment the track for the Curra is good, good to firm in places for the weekend racing. Ed, what are you doing with the Beresford? 
Interesting. There's a little bit of rain forecast Friday night into Saturday. Chance it could just, I don't think it's going to be a deluge, but it may just um, take the sting out of it for want of a better phrase. But uh, yeah, a, a really good roll of honour, as you say, Shane. Uh, St. Nicholas Abbey won this, um, likes of Japan, the mighty sea, the stars, um, Saxon Warrior, and even your your favourite friend, your best friend, High Definition, managed to uh, to win this last season, <laughs> Shane. It's a potential uh, hurdler, High Definition. I think absolutely, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm mm. waiting for the entries to the Cheltenham October meeting. Uh, keep my eyes on those but uh, yeah high definition uh, to be to be uh, declared there but um yeah it's uh, it's definitely an intriguing encounter Aidan O'Brien has farmed this contest he's won the last 10 renewals of the Beresford Stakes quite remarkable really and uh, relies on Luxembourg here who um yeah, again from middle distance pedigree was off the bridle a, lo- a long way out uh, it has to be said in, in in a very average maiden at Kalani however it looked a bit green, but when the penny did drop in the closing stages, one going away, I think the horse is very much learning on the job. I think we'll be a lot sharper for that outing. Uh, traditionally, looking at the breeding next season, a mile and a half uh, looks the uh, the obvious port to call in a year's time. But uh, for now, interesting, he had a whole host of entries, as he always does. They've relied on Luxembourg, uh, a well-bred individual who, um, as I said, I think they should be a lot sharper and know the job a lot more after the debut at Kalani in which he won. And yeah, I, I, I think he's the one they've got to beat. Yeah, I think it's going to be uh, very, very hard to beat as well. But I, I'll be honest, I think it's actually the, the one race all weekend that I'm looking forward to the most because I think we will see legitimate derby contenders emerge for next year. All right, let's switch our attention to the Curra on Sunday. We've got a couple of Group 3 contests to talk about. We'll start with the World Park Stakes, seven furlongs. Now, we're still waiting on uh, the final acceptances to come through, but we'll just whip through and have a look at the uh, the entries for it. El Bull is there. We've got Sigamia for uh, the uh, daughter of uh, Caraconti. We've got uh, Concert Halls being nommed. Dancing Rebels there. Eriske is also in the field for Dermot World. Hello You, History for Coolmore and uh, Aidan O'Brien. Homeless Songs, who cost me heavily when she got beaten last starts there. Juncture, uh, Limity de Greccio is also there. Lovely Manners there. Madonna de la Rocio uh, is also in the field. Um, On a Merry Dance is taking her place potentially for Joseph O'Brien. Uh, Pastime, Pinkfire Lily, Prettiest Seaside is also nommed. Sunset Shiraz, uh, Tinabrism, who we mentioned earlier, is probably going to the Group 1. Tranquil Lady, uh, Trevor Nuance has also been uh, put into the field. And West Coast is the other one. So we've currently got 22 set to potentially take their place. Stephen, any early thoughts? Yeah, I, I really like Al Bula, the top one here, Shane. Joseph O'Brien made a winning debut at Nace, unfancied 12 to 1. That'd be very rare for this stable to have a horse win unfancied like that. Um, I think she was being ridden on the future and surprised them quick enough, really. Then a few weeks later, she was at 5 to 4 on. Um, that was at the cut over a mile. And if you watch that run back, um, she never gave her back as a moment's worry until somehow she got beat in the last 100 yards. I think she idled. She cruised into the lead and the race was over. It was almost a race she'd stopped watching. Uh, and her old rival came through up the inside and pinned her right on the post. I think she'll be ridden with more patience. She's back a furlong here if she turns up to seven, which will suit her. She's got loads of speed and I think she's held in very high regard. So if she turns up, she's the one I'm most interested in. OK, Ed, what's your view? Well, nothing specifically before this race, but I'm a bit like a broken record. The, the horse I flagged up on previous shows is one for next year. is the Philly Concert Hall. I keep saying it. I find it remarkable. I think there's a little bit of a waiting game going on here. Like I said she's running over seven furlongs again. Uh, she was fourth in the Moy Glare last time out, doing all her best work at the closing stages. She was gaining on them um, over the seven that day. She's from a stout middle distance pedigree. I mean, a dam won the Oaks. Uh, she's related to a whole host of performers, uh, closely related to Mile 6 winner. Uh, yet she's running around on these these quick ground seven furlong contests. Just keep her in the notebooks for next year. I'm sure she will just explode to life, a bit like Snowfall did to some extent, in the terms of when she goes up to her proper trip. I think there's a lot more to come. So uh, I'm quite intrigued by why they're kind of not, overfacing her maybe they just think they're going to let her bide her time and um, wait to next year before they they go to some longer distances but um 
yeah, she's still the one. Concert Hall for next season, middle distance is in mind. Again, seven furlongs here, be too sharp, but watch a replay of the run over course and distance at Group 1 company last time out. Uh, she was about six, seven lengths uh, behind them at the furlong pole, narrowed that down to about three at the line. She wants a proper test of stamina next season, so don't give up on her. I think she's about 50 to 1 for the Oaks. I'm almost talking myself into throwing a few quid on it. Smart, I like it. All right, let's have a look at the uh, the other Group 3 on the contest. This is the Rare Asshole Stakes. Now, it's over two miles. Now, this is a race that we'll probably see some of these horses progress to either the Prix de Cadran at Paris Longchamp on Arc Day or even to Ascot for Champions Day in the Sayers race. Uh, we've currently got uh, 21 horses still uh, nommed. Amran Nafian for Aidan O'Brien. Aircraft Carrier is also uh, an early nomination. Falcon 8 for Dermot World. Henry de Bromhead's got Lismore. Master of Reality for Joseph O'Brien and Lloyd Williams. Micromanage is nommed in the field for Willie Mullins. He's also got Mount Leinster nominated for the race. Presto is there. Shoshon Warrior for Joseph O'Brien. Willie Mullins with the old boy Stratum. Barrington Court for Jessica Harrington. Nina Walsh has got Dinard Rose. Uh, Federica Sophia for Dermot World. Andrew Slattery with Pineapple Express. Search for a song for Dermot World. Jessica Harrington with Silence Please. Yekseni for Joe Lyons. Donica O'Brien with Fernando Vici, the three-year-old son of Australia. Ruling for Joseph O'Brien. Seattle Sound for Luke Corner. And the Mediterranean for Aidan O'Brien. So still a potential lineup uh, of big numbers, Stephen, but no doubt it'll whittle away a little bit as we get to acceptances. Who do you like? Well, th this is sort of one of those staying races, Shane, with a lot of disappointing horses who sort of look a bit tripless that I think they've sort of had a go at two miles because they've run out of options at a mile four and not been winning and been expensive to follow all summer. Stratum, who was the one I was drawn to initially, I mean, I watched him run at York behind, I know it's behind Stradivarius, so he's down 10 grades, but he was falling out the back of the TV at York. It's, I know horses can do that at York and bounce back, but it's difficult to be with him after that. I thought the one who might be overpriced is Pineapple Express, who's basically a hard-knocking handicapper who's probably got about £20 to find on the ratings, but has never run beyond a mile five in quite a long career, uh, but has often shaped like a thorough stayer. Um, she won the other day over a mile four at the Curra on soft ground, where she was under pressure a long way out and rallied really generously. And then she ran another absolute screamer in a valuable handicap last time. Again, under pressure a long way out and sticking on really bravely. I've no idea if she'll stay or if this is her target, but the one thing she is, is race fit giving her running, uh, and a lot of these have got a lot of big question marks over their well-being at the minute. Yeah, good point you make. What about you, Ed? Do you have a firm view for the two-mile feature? No, scratching my head, just a couple of points of uh, interest. We had Mount Leinster uh, was definitely it was a horse who was backed into favourite for the e -ball last time out. I mean, a lot of the, the Mullins camp wouldn't hear a defeat. Yet yeah, uh, ran deplorably as though his legs were tied together. I haven't really heard a kind of a, an official excuse for that run, if you see what I'm saying. But uh, previously to that, looked progressive on the flat. Was a useful, useful bumper horse, and so I wouldn't be at all surprised if that horse got back on the straight and narrow. But just to um, touch upon my previous point, uh, previous point regarding Concert Hall uh, on the earlier on the card, uh, horse number one on here, Amran Nabafan, is very closely related to Concert Hall, and you've got Concert Hall over seven furlongs. Amran Nabifi, I'm running over two miles. That just backs up my, my kind of stamina angle, I'm saying, about Concert Hall for next season. But, um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a tricky old race, this. Uh, a lot of tripless wonders, as we used to say at the Racing Post. And uh, I think a few trainers uh, looking at this and thinking, look, this is a decent enough prize. Uh, perhaps we can uh, we can go and scoop a pot here. But, yeah, Mount Leinster ran almost too bad to be true uh, in the Ebor last time out. Was was beaten uh, the length of the home straight. And uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised if it was, it was back on the, uh, on the winning trail here. All right, plenty of good discussions. Make sure you head to irishracing.com. Those fields will be finalised very soon for the Carra on Sunday. But it's now time for the tips of the week. All right, guys. Now, I did threaten the other week if I didn't land the winner last week. I was putting myself on the sidelines, banning myself because I'm out of tipping form. And I'm committing to that. So I'm, uh, I'm not tipping this week. I'm going to focus on you guys, though, because you have been in good form throughout the, uh, the last few months. Although we did have a bit of a challenge last weekend. Stephen, we'll start with you as we reflect on uh, your performance. We missed out last week. Al Azi let us all down. He was horrible. At, uh, at Newbury. I won't forgive him for that. He really was very weak. Uh, Gulliver missed out uh, in the uh, Mill Reef Stakes. Phoebe ran uh, well, but uh, couldn't get the job done. And uh, that is uh, our look back to you. But let's focus on who you're going to land as a winner this week. Who do you like? 
Yeah, well, I'm still blushing after Al Arzi, Shane. It was one of those races, wasn't it? Um, turning for home, it was all panning out beautifully. And then that sort of sense of dread as he began to come under pressure. You could, he was curling up, wasn't he? It, it was a really, really disappointing performance. And, and we got the market, right? But not you can't really shout that to the bailiffs through your letterbox, can you? Hopefully we're <laughs> on to better things um, on Saturday. Um, it's hard racing, but hopefully we've found a couple of value. I might do an each way double as well, Shane. Um, to get us out of trouble. I thought Desert Dreamer, who's I think at least 14 to 1 for looking, is very much a filly who's overpriced. Um, she's closely matched with Sand Dream, but she's three times bigger in the market. I think they're the same horse on their York running. I think the test of speed at Newmarket on hopefully fast ground by Saturday will suit her better than Sand Dream. I think she's her line's favourite to beat, who, who could be different level to be fair, but at 14 to 1, I'm willing to pay to find out. And in the big race at 3.40, fantastic Fox. We've already touched on why. At Zaney, replacing D'Souza, hasn't settled in any of his four handicaps yet. Pulled hard and 35 runners. If he doesn't settle, he's never going to. So I think he'll drop the bit for the first time and come through late and pick these off. And he's 16 to 1, as I say. Play each way with the extra places. Perhaps do an each way double the pair of them. All right, you've got some value there. And, of course, uh, just recapping what a phenomenal season you've had for us uh, on Jump Tour. You're 66 and a half units ahead for the year, despite the fact that we uh, struck out last week. So uh, hopefully you can bounce back this weekend. All right, Ed, let's reflect on uh, your performance last weekend. You lost five units, but you're certainly ahead in the count uh, with 11 units in profit. Unfortunately, Silk Romance let us down and the uh, Phillies condition stakes. Of course, Baradar missed out in the Dubai Duty Free. Uh, I think we... Uh, also have Headmistress and Dogon also let us down. So I've got faith in you, Ed. I've said that all the way through this season. You you had a really good run of form for us. Who do you like this weekend? Yeah, last week all went pear-shaped, didn't it? Yeah, Silk Romance, I think, went off a ridiculously short price and got collared in the end. One of the, the few Charlie Apple horses to have been beaten in about the last five months. And then um, I referred to Dogon on last week's show, Shane, as a bit, as I said, it gets to kind of nine o'clock on a Saturday oh. night, hitting uh, kind of peak dance floor hours. The Jaeger bombers are going at the bar <laughs> and there's Shane Anderson yawning, ordering his taxi so he can go home and watch the Antiques Roadshow. And uh, Do <laughs> Dogon... Dogon pretty much did that. That was my fear. For 95% of that race, jumped them into the ground, six legs clear coming into the home straight, and then started yawning in the last 100 yards, folded like a pack of cards mm. and got collared. Uh, that drove me absolutely bonkers, it has to be said. But um, anyway, yeah, a, a really frustrating individual. That The horse, not you, Shane. Uh, uh, appreci I appreciate it, Ed. I appreciate <laughs> it. But you've actually summed up me uh, at a nightclub for about the last 20 years of my life, so I can't complain too much. <laughs> well, fingers crossed we'll have, um, we have some more. <laughs> the 20 uh, some more sprightly performances yeah. this week uh, so um yeah we've got we've got three picks here uh, this will do nicely for jamie snowden in worcester uh, this horse was going to win over quarter distance last time out uh had the race sewn up in my view before crashing out at the final flight you're feeling no feeling no ill effects on the back of that i think can um get the job done here in what doesn't look the strongest of races on paper uh, Masakila, we talked about earlier on in the show, has a very good form in the book. Looked at a strong stare at the seven over Newby, at Newby last time out, stepping up to a mile. I think we'll take a lot of beating, a tough individual uh, for the Andrew Baldy team. Then Art Power uh, had a successful trip over to Ireland last year. This is a horse who's been knocking on the door in all the Group 1 sprints over here, your Royal Ascots and Goodwoods, etc., all, all season long. Takes a big drop in grade here, down to Group 3. On official ratings, has at least £8 in hand. Uh, I think odds against looks very fair, personally. The only one thing which will make you a little bit reticent is all this horse's best form has come on soft ground. But again, looking at the weather, there is a, there are a lot of showers forecast Friday into Saturday. It won't turn the ground soft, but I think it will definitely take the sting out of it. If Art Power can't win that Group 3, as I said, with officially £8 in hand, uh, Connections is going to be scratching their head as to where they go uh, from there on in. But uh, yeah, three to hopefully get us back on track uh, this week. All right, I think uh, with a bit of luck you will do that, and there's certainly been a bit of market uh, money around for these horses that you've highlighted. This will do nicely, uh, Masakila, and also Art Power. So, good luck to you, Ed. Now, uh, what I will do, uh, Ed, uh, we've just got a slight technical issue, so I'll start with you. Uh, what are you looking forward to the most this weekend? I mentioned earlier I'm quite keen to see what the Beresford Stakes uh, will do at the Curra on Saturday as a, as a form reference going on potentially to, to maybe the Derby next year. What are you looking forward to the most? 
Yep, I would agree with you there, Shane. Informative race. Uh, pretty much this is a, a weekend of information would be the general way I would look at it. Um, obviously, we've got like the, the ARC meeting uh, coming up, which I like to get stuck into, and some of the big jumps meetings on the horizon, which are very much betting mediums for me. Uh, this one, a load of two-year-old races, a lot of information to be gleaned through the three-year-old campaigns, the Beresford Stakes, the Middle Park, the Cheveley Park, and then you have the... Uh, you have the Rubik's Q, which is the Cambridgeshire, which is one I'll happily sit out. But again, lots of uh, note taking. And I'm sure we'll be talking about a lot of these horses that win this weekend in, in the months to come. So, yeah, very much looking forward to it, Shane. Great working with you as always. Good luck this weekend, Ed. Stephen, good to have you back online after a slight little technical issue there. Um, what are you <laughs> looking forward to the most this weekend? Well, big race, the Cambridgeshire, fantastic betting race. Um, trying to lay Uncle Bryn at around five to one. I'm expecting him to drift and have a a few way on Fantastic Fox. All right. Great working with you as well. Good luck to you. There we have it. Uh, Stephen Harris and Ed Quigley joining us here on A Jump To It. Of course, make sure you head to Stephen's tips on bettingexpert.com each and every week. Of course, he provides uh, daily tips for racing in the UK with his best bet or his nap bet and his value bet. And as we keep touching on with Jump To It, Stephen's been in fantastic form all the way through the year. And of course, head to irishracing.com where you get all the latest news, opinion, betting odds, form guides, and amazing information for racing uh, in Ireland, in the UK, and also some other parts of the world. Vincent and the team do a fantastic job. Hope you've enjoyed today's edition of Jump To It. We'll see you again next week.